Hello and welcome. This episode of The Newsmakers is a little different from the others. It's my last. And so what has been a really valuable experience for me has come to an end. The team and I thought it's a good opportunity to look back on some of the work we've done together. To me, a great privilege of hosting this show was about being able to connect people, to moderate debates that were often uncomfortable, but always necessary. Here are a few highlights from the past few years. We're not getting evidence of people learning skills. We're not getting evidence of people growing as individuals and well, becoming better I people. We're, you, getting, we're getting reports of torture I, and repression. I, I, yes? If, if, if you want to believe that the Chinese are just, uh, have decided that they want to repress a bunch of people for no apparent reason. I don't want to believe it. I'm just static. reading the documents. Well, you're reading the document, but I mean, the, the, the setup of the show, of course, is, is very uh, one-sided. Uh, from the Chinese perspective, if you went on the streets of Beijing, Shanghai, or any other places, and you asked them, what should the government be doing? They said, they should be doing exactly what they're doing. In, okay. some, in some cases, they'd say, but be if that's harsher. Okay, but that doesn't, this is that the, doesn't the, mean the, it would the, be morally the, right, right? I know, if, if the people, I'm, I'm not if people saying, are being repressed, it doesn't I'm make it morally right, yes. I'm not morally right or wrong. There are differences in uh, how cultures okay. look at each other in terms of things like in, in Asia, uh, the state and the society takes precedence. But are you saying individual. it is? Are you, say, are you saying, sir, that it is culturally acceptable in China to treat the Uyghur people as subhuman? Not subhuman. To make sure that there is no problem. Because, sir, why you know, is amnesty you... credible when it comes to the other side's crimes and not to your side's crimes? No, no, no. I mean, they, you know, whoever committed the crime should be charged with, with the international standard. There was no, you know, uh, the double standard. I doesn't mean that, I don't mean that it was a double standard. It should have, you know, like kind of, whoever made it uh, the committed the crime should be, okay. you know, investigated, okay. should be okay. exposed. So let me ask you, Mang Zani, same question then. How come you weren't flagging up Amnesty's reports up until this moment as well? Why did you not have problems with their methodology until they turn the focus on our side. Well, I, mean, I only look at uh, the report on its own merit, yeah? The fact that Amnesty International has issued 17 press releases mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, written um, reports in the past uh, and uh, applied rigorous methodology, that's not necessarily guaranteed that this report uh, would be uh, of the standard, uh, of the same standard. To be honest, from the alias and from the, I mean, uh, Arab alias and uh, Saudi and, and all the loyal forces with, with them, really, they have, they have done so many efforts in favor of strengthening the legitimacy, facing the, 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 the coup, and also helping people in Yemen. I can't really, I can't imagine if there is... But they're not helping right now. There's a blockade. <laughs> There All is, those stats I've given you show is, you the is, terrible there, humanitarian there situation. No, there, I'm saying, fine, the Houthis are wrong for firing rockets. They're wrong for a coup. They're wrong. They will be held to account for their crimes. But my question is, is a blockade the right thing to do when so many people are starving and dying of cholera right now in the country? I can assure you that for the food and also for the drugs, it's a, as an open gate for them to reach. If you go now to Sana'a, you will see there is food and also there is some drugs are there in, in so many places. I mean, okay. so it's not, it's not a complete blockade. But I agree with you. We They've announced, the Saudis have announced it as a blockade. That's why I, we're no, doing when, this. You know, when I say blockade, blockade to stop entering these smuggling of weapons from seashores and from So was it wrong areas. to then stop the Red Cross well, and their shipment of chlorine tablets? To be tablets? honest, I can speak really very frankly. Most of the UN agencies in Yemen are doing their reports and they, have, they are biased and they're working in favor of militias. So I is the Red Cross very working loudly. in favor of the militias? When you take about these things, you have to also be aware and you have to deal with it and you have to read between the lines and all this. I passed through Beshiktash on, on the weekend, just got off the ferry coming from the Asian side. It was very vibrant, a lot of opposition supporters. You had HTP supporters, uh, CHP supporters, E-Party supporters, campaigning, young people, and so forth. Jem believes all of that's a circus, and those people are, are, are being involved in a, in a system that is rigged against them. What's your response to him? 
we may uh, discuss, agree or disagree on many parts of, the, of this government to be democratic or otherwise. But I think if you look at the history of Turkish elections and the reaction of the people, you will see that the actual the elections in Turkey are probably the most fairest and most democratic of all institutions in Turkey. It was a place of worship for Muslims and in 1992, yeah. More than 2,000 people were killed. Do you accept that what the Hindu mobs did in 1992 was wrong? See, according to me, there was nothing like that which was done in 1992, and that's what precisely our case so is before the criminal, uh, those before the criminal court. But but the way, Vishnu, but the way this entire incident has been picturized. Who killed those people? I don't How think that die? there was any any killing or something. There okay. is a there is a report by the chief minister that sitting go. chief minister Mr. Kalyan okay. Singh. He said that yes, the car sevaks are on the disputed structure. They have demolished it, but there are no incidents okay. of violence. But if you have no some incidents adverse, of violence, uh, okay, okay, reports, this is very so revealing. I am not aware I, of it. I, I was not aware that your views were this absurd when it comes to this because you're denying the death of two thousand people. The Prime Minister See, of India is talking to you, about... According to you, my views can be absurd. According to me, your views can be absurd. But I am here to tell you my viewpoint. What happened and to the 2000... And if you don't believe with my viewpoint, then you, can, then, you can, then you can ask me to leave the show. I have no problem. No, I don't want you to leave the show because I think your but mindset's you quite no right. revealing. I, I have no, a right you to... You have no right to call my views as absurd. I think they're absurd. You have no people. right to call my views as it's absurd. You, you have called me as a panelist before yes, you certainly. to tell me my views. You have you every can't right say to that share my your views. views. Are absurd. Certainly. You, are, you are trying to put your words in my mouth. You are so, saying in 1992, 2,000 people were killed. How am I? No. no. How, how will I know that fact that 2,000 people were killed by Hindu mob? And this is a very sensitive topic. You can't Vishnu, blame you have a particular right. incident on a community itself. Certainly. Vishnu, you have every right to share your views. And I have every right to unpack those views, analyze them. And if you're denying the death of more than 2,000 people, which is completely established by everyone in India but right no, now, except your you group, saying that Hindus I, have, are killed. I, I my, have a right to say your views are with you is when you are saying that... Hin oh, so now they were but killed, but Hindus didn't kill them. Okay. When you say Hindus okay. have killed 2,000 Muslims, so you so that you accept I don't that agree. They, okay, so you accept that 2,000 were killed. That's great. My colleagues and I got to make some really interesting documentaries as well. And then we would come back here to debate the issue on the show with our guests. I felt very lucky to travel into the very core of contentious issues and just try to understand better. From North Korea to the KKK to even the land expropriation issue in my home country, South Africa, here are some brief moments. The white robes and hooded cloaks the burning crosses. Their conviction that elites have robbed white Europeans of their place in society. And their commitment to racial segregation. Ever since I was born, I've just seen I was born racist. I've always hated it. You know, I've seen walking down the street, just hate it. Today, the Klan can be found online. They organize over the internet. And some groups feel the time is right to enter politics. The time is now. A revolution is coming in the United States of America. The Ku Klux Klan are mysterious, elusive, and very difficult to reach. Almost impossible to talk to even if you're their preferred brand of human, Caucasian. I'm Imran Garda. South African of Indian descent. This is my personal journey through the flyover states in the heart of America into the small pockets of this vast superpower in towns you might never have heard of before to meet the Klan. I thought North Korea would be one place where I'd finally feel tall, but the statues and monuments here are enough to dwarf anyone. Piercing the Pyongyang skyline and standing nearly 200 meters tall, this is the Juche Tower, the ultimate expression of North Korean beliefs. At the base of this mammoth Juche Tower is a poem dedicated to Kim Il-sung for his 70th birthday in 1982. The fifth stanza of this poem reads, man is the master of everything and he decides everything and decides his own destiny, which emphasizes the Juche um, need and emphasis on complete and absolute self-reliance. Mm -hmm. 
Self-reliance is a source of much pride here. And pride is at the heart of North Korea's ideology. Pride of race, pride of nation, perpetual reliving of past injustices by foreign aggressors, be it Japan or the United States, hatred for their southern neighbors who are deemed brothers in blood, but not in politics. It's a holy place in a country with no religion, endlessly glorifying a leader who taught his people that man, not God, controls his destiny. You're on the Irish side. So when we're on Bombay Street and this neighborhood, Clonard, it's basically what we call ground zero of the troubles of Belfast. This is where it all kicked off and it just exploded from here. Across the road there, first thing that you notice coming into the street were those photographs. And they're all photographs of members of the IRA from this neighborhood, from Clonard, who have been killed on active duty. To those guys on the other side of the road, on the other side of the fence, these are terrorists. These are terrorists. And to the people here... These are heroes, these are soldiers, they're men who have fought for their country, for independence. These Barelvis are part of a block of Islamist groups known as Tahrik al Baik Ya Rasulullah, and are known for being a little spikier than the rest. Okay, are you cool? I met one of their leaders, Ashraf Jalali, in a not so private interview. It's a lot of cameras. I think your team has more cameras than my team. <laughs> yeah? When somebody says they want to give you land, what does that mean to you? What do you picture? You know, having my own big house. <laughs> having my own garden nearby. And seeing my kids and my grandkids. Yeah, around. To me, this show isn't just about meeting powerful people. It was about keeping powerful people honest and holding them to account. Sometimes they pushed back really hard. Sometimes their supporters made their hatred for me quite personal on social media. But it was worth it. And it was a great responsibility that I truly loved. So, yeah. You mentioned that there were several yeah. high-profile people, politicians, celebrities, Harvard professors, heads of state, ministers, who also got these right. massages right. that had nothing nefarious about them. Are you willing Not to name these some names? massages. You see, that's, you see, that's your bias. That's your bias. These uh, massages. Are you willing to you name associate names? them with you, the women you willing to, who gave you're, you're him proper massages? You're getting terribly defensive here, and I'm asking you I if am. there are other named, people who I've can named, who can also well, you're getting, share the same you're thing. You're getting terribly accusatory. Yes. So they're relying on you and the experts to build a case. For me, you're leaving little doubt. You're hardly being cautious. They're going. Richard Butler's telling us this guy's got the goods and we've got to go after them. Am I, am I reading this wrong? No, I don't think you are. Um, the distinction I was trying to draw a moment ago is between whether or not the weapons existed and our ability to verify their presence or absence. Saddam, as I reported in the last instance to the Security Council, and I, it would appear also to the Senate here, mm -hmm. had never allowed us to do the latter. I trust our rules of engagement that every case will be investigated Conclusions will be made, are made, and will continue to defend our borders, defend our sovereignty, and fight terrorism. The Gazan people have a choice. Can I ask you, before we go to what you, what you feel the Gazan people should choose, what is more likely, that this guy was Hamas and that the State Department gave a grant of almost $12,000 to a Hamas operative, a senior Hamas operative, whose rank your defense minister knows, or that he's a journalist and your defense minister's lying? What do you think my answer will be? I don't know. Tell me. I am waiting for the result of the investigation. Is it likely that the U.S. State Department I would not... give a $12,000 grant to a Hamas operative? I don't know what the uh, answer 
to such a question is. I'm not speaking for the Americans and their vetting procedures. I'm saying one thing. All the evidence seems to suggest he was a journalist. The Norwegian Refugee Council hired him. Do you think they hire Hamas? I am waiting for the result of the investigation. If the result shows he was a journalist, what would your answer be? I think that if the result shows, it's a hypothetical question. I'm waiting for the end of the investigation. Let's go back to your op-ed. The youth of the region are very excited about the new opportunities and are looking for education and employment. Naturally, right? Naturally, that's what young people want around the world. The youth of Kashmir have responded enthusiastically to 50,000 new government jobs and recruitment in the Indian Army. With normalcy returning, a new era of peace and prosperity dawns. So, now you're the telling me that... 50,000 jobs that I referred to are in the government, the jobs in the okay. army are in addition to that. And recruitment in the uh, Indian Army, right? So, for young people in the valley, the same army of restrictions, curfews for months... The Sorry, same no um, curfews. Restrictions. Yeah. Let's not get entangled on the semantics. Restrictions. You accept yeah. restrictions? Yes? Uh, but today, okay. as I said... Okay, but the same but army... But today, as I said, the not same army in, of no curfews after restrictions. Burhan Wani, after, after Burhan Wani, they had 100 days of restrictions. Yes? Fact. Okay? So the same army of curfews, the same army that blinds them with pellets when they protest, they are enthusiastic to join that army. Is this a joke? So they cannot tell the Afghan people that they didn't know. The airspace is in their hands, the communication is in their hands, the uh, area is under, under their complete, absolute surveillance. There is no way that they can excuse themselves or offer excuses in this regard. No, we don't believe it, and they are to blame. To an American who would watch this and say, we sacrificed thousands of our soldiers Sorry for to that. defend Afghanistan yes. and to bring about a semblance of democracy to this shaky country. We helped bring you, Mr. Karzai, to the yes. presidency. Yes. And now you're saying we're just like ISIS. How dare you? Yes. Well, I dare very much. Because I'm right. They came, they supported us, we welcomed them. A doctor comes to you and says, I want to treat you. Mm -hmm. And then he gives you the wrong medicine. Do you continue with him? You don't. Do you feel, given that peace has not been fully achieved yet, that you might not absolutely deserve it right now? Well, it's not for me to uh, judge that. It's uh, the, the committee of the Nobel Prize, and they said it very clearly. We give this uh, Nobel Peace Prize to Mr. Santos because of his efforts. Uh, not because he achieved the peace, it's the efforts. Uh, fail, you might succeed, but you have to try. And that's what I did. You might not like this question, but I'm going to ask it anyway. I saw in your communique with President Erdogan, you spoke about support for the Palestinian people, for example, reaffirming support for the Palestinian people. You're doing business with China. Does that mean you can't criticize them when it comes to what they're doing to the Uyghurs and putting possibly a million Uyghur Muslims in re-education camps that look like concentration camps? Uh, I, I do not know the exact situation of this. Frankly, I mean, I, I just have to tell you the truth. Uh, you know, in Pakistan at the moment, uh, since we've been in power uh, four months, I've, I've taken five days off. I, I'm serious, five days in four months. It's because of, you know, the intensity of the issues which we immediately faced. New government comes in, first time in power. Uh, you know, there were so many different issues to settle. So, to be honest, I actually don't know much about the situation. But I can tell you one thing. The Chinese have been, uh, what can I say, I mean, in this doom and gloom which we inherited, the Chinese have been a breath of fresh air for us. Has Poland had a history yes. of problems with Muslims? Yes or no? No. Okay. No, not how at all. How many Muslims are in Poland? Not at all. How we've got, we've got Tatars. Uh, we've got Tatars who are, so, I'm telling you. Yeah. Listen, how many Muslims we've got Poland? Tatars who are in Poland for 700 years. Yeah. 1%, maybe. It's less than 0.1%. But what I'm trying to right. say, I'm trying to say that we've got 
We, we, want to have, we want to have peaceful people. It has nothing to do with a religion. It has nothing to do with Islamophobia. But you just told me it has As something to do with As I said, we've got Tatars religion. who are so peaceful, who fought... You just said you won't have no. one because they're related to, to terrorism and rapes, modern, right? radical... Imran, listen to me, listen to me. I'm talking about the wave right. of illegal migration okay. which started in 2015. Not about religion, but it's linked to the, to the religion and radical okay. Islamists. But I'm if not I have to look at Islam Poland's history, if I have to look at Poland's history... I'm talking about this wave and about this madness certainly, started by Germany certainly, in Europe. Certainly, Dominic, historically Poland has far, have had far more problems with Christians than they have had with Muslims, haven't they? Have Muslims been involved in partitions? Death camps, no. invasions in no. Poland. No, 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 no. We've got, we've got, we, as you, as you know, our King Sobieski stopped Muslims by um, in Vienna. So that's the very uh, huge achievement in the history of Polish right. history. Okay, if so not King Sobieski, in the 18th century, uh, Poland was partitioned over three times. Was now it by, we have Hijra, was it by as you know, powers? you know what Hijra means. And I'm saying you want to talk about Vienna. What I'm saying is, okay, if we want to go to history, what? Poland was put, partitioned three times. Was it done by <laughs> Muslim powers? And now and then, sometimes to be a bit playful, sometimes to play devil's advocate, but usually just to highlight a bit of hypocrisy, I went off script. Hold on, not so fast. There are major irregularities with this vote, including more than 5 million unverified ballots. So, fine. Everyone thought Raila and his supporters were sore losers, but when the judicial branch of government cancelled the win for the incumbent, President Uhuru Kenyatta, and called for a rerun, you would expect that to be welcomed, right? Nope, not by everyone. Take a look at this Bloomberg headline. Kenya plunges into turmoil after court annuls presidential vote. Plunged into turmoil. Why? This was something unprecedented. For far too often on the continent, the law is an ass, the donkey type, not the other one, where politicians treat it as a beast of burden to just get to where they need to go. Not this time in Kenya. Let me give you a quick comparison with another election last month in Rwanda. Paul Kagame has been in charge for 17 years. He came to power after a horrendous genocide and he did a lot of good things to get the country back on its feet. He recently won 99% of the vote. I'm no Catholic, but I don't think even the Pope would be able to get 99% of the votes in Vatican City. If you look closely, there's a recurring word every time you look at the reaction, media-wise, to Kagame's 99% win. Take a look at some keywords, or one in particular. Have a look at that word, stability. Why isn't the authoritarianism in Rwanda a cause for concern? Why is it always Stability, stability. Why won't it possibly plunge the country into turmoil? Are we conditioned to believe, when it comes to Africa, that the tighter the grip, the more stable the country? It has been my privilege to be here for the past four and a half years. I am leaving, but the show, as they say, must go on. And new episodes will follow very soon with Ali Aslan. I hope the work I've done here has added some value to journalism, to civil discourse in Turkey and beyond. Wherever you've been watching from, thank you for being with me on this journey. Until we meet again, kendinize iyi bakın. Bye-bye.